Welcome to part 9 of this series on Moby Dick. In this lecture, we will discuss chapters 48 through 54. In chapter 48, just before they lower their boats to chase whales for the first time on the voyage, the crew of the Pequod learns that there have been five Asian men hiding in the hull of the ship. Captain Ahab selected these men to be the crew of his own harpooning boat, and he smuggled them on board before the voyage. Despite the sudden appearance of these men, the rest of the crew lower themselves into their boats and begin to chase the whales. The chase, however, is unsuccessful. Queequeg manages to harpoon a whale, but the fish overturns their small craft. The other boats return to the ship, believing that Queequeg and the crew of his boat are lost. However, they find the men the following morning clutching onto planks and oars from the destroyed craft. Melville's description of the whale chase is as thrilling as any modern action film though not one of the oarsmen was then facing the life-and-death peril so close to them ahead. Yet with their eyes on the intense countenance of the mate in the stern of the boat, they knew that the imminent instant had come. They heard, too, an enormous wallowing sound, as of fifty elephants stirring in their litter. Meanwhile, the boat was still booming through the mist, the waves curling and hissing around us like the erected crests of enraged serpents. In chapter 49, Ishmael reflects on his escape from death. As a crew member of Queequeg's harpooning boat, Ishmael was one of the men given up for lost by the other men of the Pequod. This experience causes Ishmael to develop a new sense of appreciation for life. He feels as if he has received extra time to live, and he determines to enjoy it. He develops an attitude similar to the carefree attitude of Stubb. There are certain queer times and occasions in this strange, mixed affair we call life when a man takes this whole universe for a vast practical joke. That odd sort of wayward mood I am speaking of comes over a man only in some time of extreme tribulation. It comes in the very midst of his earnestness, so that what just before might have seemed to him a thing most momentous now seems but a part of the general joke. There is nothing like the perils of whaling to breed this free and easy sort of genial desperado philosophy, and with it I now regarded this whole voyage of the Pequod and the great white whale its object. In chapter 50, Ishmael notes that Ahab's choice to personally command a harpoon boat is uncommon for captains in the whaling industry because of the risk of injury. Ahab's decision is especially surprising considering the loss of his leg. Ishmael supposes that Ahab smuggled his Asian boat crew onto the Pequod to avoid raising the suspicions of the owners Bildad and Peleg. Ahab's boat crew is composed of Orientals. Ishmael describes the men as devilish-looking and intimidating, especially the boat crew's leader and harpooner, Fadala. One cannot sustain an indifferent air concerning Fadala. He was such a creature as civilized, domestic people in the temperate zone only see in their dreams, and that but dimly. Ishmael also suggests that Fadala has some considerable influence over Ahab, but what this influence is will remain a mystery until the end of the novel. In chapter 51, Ishmael describes a strange phenomenon. For several consecutive nights, the watch sees a solitary spout of air from a whale. Some crew members believe that the mysterious spout of air is from Moby Dick, leading them toward their doom. But the crew has resigned itself to fate, and no attempt is made to dissuade Ahab from following the spout. In chapter 52, the Pequod encounters another whaling ship for the first time on the voyage. The other ship is called the Albatross. As the two ships pass each other, Ahab calls out to the other captain, asking him whether he has seen Moby Dick. The other captain tries to respond, but drops his horn into the sea as he is raising it to his mouth. The Pequod's crew regards this occurrence as an omen. While the albatross is passing the Pequod, Ishmael observes the sailors on the other ship. He compares the grand-sounding phrase, voyage around the world, with the grim faces of the sailors who have been at sea for over four years. Ishmael concludes that all the pride and glory of humanity is like a trip around the world. It sounds impressive, but ultimately it brings you back to the points you were before you embarked. There is never any progress. Round the world, there is much in that sound to inspire proud feelings. But where to does all that circumnavigation conduct? In pursuit of those far mysteries we dream of, or in tormented chase of that demon phantom that, sometime or other, swims before all human hearts, while chasing such over this round globe, they either lead us on in barren mazes or midway leave us whelmed. In chapter 53, Ishmael explains that a gam is a meeting between two or more whale ships at sea. During a gam, the ships often exchange news about whaling and recent events on land. 
The internet and cell phones did not exist in the late 19th century, so sailors at sea depended upon other ships to send messages to their loved ones at home. Ishmael writes that Ahab refused to engage in a gam with another ship unless the other captain had news of Moby Dick. Ahab's refusal to interact with other whaling ships isolates the ship's crew from external affairs. Thus, Ahab's single focus becomes the crew's single focus, Moby Dick. In chapter 54, Ishmael recounts a gam between the Pequod and another ship called the Townho. During this gam, the crew of the Pequod learns that the Townho recently lost one of its officers to Moby Dick. The crew members of the Townho believe that it was by the direct command of God that the white whale killed the officer, because the officer had unjustly punished a sailor. By ascribing the act of Moby Dick to God, Melville reinforces the theme of fate. Everything happens in accord with the will of God or the will of the fates. Though the sailors look for omens and indications of the future, they accept that they cannot alter their destiny. This acceptance leads some of them, like Ishmael and Stubb, to adopt a carefree and joyful attitude. Ahab, on the other hand, sets about the task of his fate with stern determination. Don't forget to subscribe and join us for part 10 of this series on Moby Dick.